Good evening. Good evening on this very warm August Wednesday night. <laughs> All right, let's we'll get a seat and then we'll pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for allowing us to, to gather in this place to worship the the true and living God. Lord, to, to sit at your feet and to just uh, sing of your praises. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we do that, Lord, that you would turn this warehouse into the temple of the Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Like him, lying in the land, seated on the throne. Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise at all night, from the rising of the sun till the end of every day. Praise at all night, all the nations of the earth. All the angels and the saints sing praise. Who's like Who best I can lying in the land, seated on the throne? Mountains bow down, every ocean roars. To the Lord of hosts, praise at all night, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise at all night, all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise, praise at all night, from the rising of the sun. To the end of every day, praise at all night. For the nations of the earth, for the angels and the saints sing
Lord, so for that, we, we're going to praise you. We're going to praise you today and every day until you bring us home. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please greet one another.
Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Gower Chapel, Savannah. Glad everyone's here tonight, including Brian Maxson. That was a treat. I did get to say hi to someone, so I was happy about that. Um, so uh, we are glad you, you guys can make it. You know, I love these, these Wednesday nights. Um, a little more intimate and uh, just going through Judges. Just a great book. So uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter 16. While you're turning there, I'm going to give you an update, give you just a couple announcements. Um, uh, first is I actually uh, was talking with Aaron Garcia uh, recent, this week. Um, and him and his wife have a... Uh, uh, they're still kind of in, they're still in Africa, um, but him and his wife, uh, Jenna, they have left the school that they were at in Uganda and now are going to do, uh, teach a school of ministry class for a few weeks, um, still in Uganda, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, and then from there, they'll get to go back to uh, Nepal and continue the, the semester of Bible college that they have in Kathmandu. Um, and so... Uh, there, he's, he's told me um, that you guys have been, a, you guys were a great encouragement, and you've been a great encouragement. I guess a few of you guys have continued to stay in contact with them, which is, you know, uh, for for people on the missions field, um, I don't think we can ever understand enough how much they appreciate that. Um, I mean, they, I know Aaron and Jenna visited like when they were here. They probably visited, I don't know, 30 churches, probably, just because, especially in Southern California where he lives, where they were staying, you know, there's a, a church on, a, a Calvary Chapel on like every block, and so they were visiting all of them, and, uh, and uh, but, uh, you know, he said, you know, he was very appreciative of, of our congregation, um, again, people still continuing to support and encourage, or encourage them, really, um, pray for them, and so they're thankful for that, um, and so you can continue to keep them in your prayers. Um, and then just some announcements. Next Wednesday, obviously, is the fourth Wednesday of the month. So we'll be having our prayer meeting, um, 7 o'clock here at the church. And then um, this Sunday, we're finishing up um, John chapter 14. Or did we just finish that up? I think we just finished it up. So we'll start John chapter 15. I don't know where I'm at today. <laughs> I know I'm in Judges 16. That, I know that much. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for tonight and just... Uh, uh, giving us another chance to open your word together, Lord, as a, the body of believers, the family. Um, and so I pray tonight that you would be glorified um, and that uh, you would just show us the things that you desire to show us, Lord, um, as you continue to grow us and teach us through your word, through your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we learned in the book of John, how, how you've sent us your Holy Spirit, who is so many things to us. Um, but one of that is that he's a teacher. And so I pray that we would be good students of your word. And, and as James says, not just hearers, but doers. Lord, that's something we need lots of, lots of grace in that area. And so, Lord, I pray you would just give that to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Judges chapter 16, as we end the life of Samson now this week, we've been kind of in his story the past two, um, two times we've been together. The first time talking about his parents um, and just how that was how his parents were visited by an angel because mom was barren and they said look you are going to have a son but he's going to be a Nazarite from birth and just we saw the faith really of his parents um, and then the lot, two weeks ago we talked about kind of the ups and downs of Samson we saw really good things he did and then we saw some really bad things he did um, but as we continue and especially the most popular portion of Samson's life Samson and Delilah as we get to that section tonight, I think we need to continue to remember Hebrews 11 as the author there in Hebrews through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit proclaimed Samson a man of great faith. And you know, as I was, these past like, well it's been, because um, we do it every other week, it's been you know, over a month that we've been in the story of Samson. And as I've been studying and, and thinking and meditating on, on what, uh, what the Lord's you know, doing here and and what he's wanting to teach, teach me and teach us. I really struggle with that. How did I view Samson? It was really hard not to, you know, just want to be like, well, that guy's an idiot. <laughs> Let's not learn anything from him. But as I started to view him through the eyes of the Lord, as I found in Hebrews 11, I started to, to view the story of Samson a lot differently. 
especially this portion here, Samson and Delilah. Now, I'm not saying what he did was right or good or anything like that. We'll see that tonight. But um, I definitely started to view him in a different light. And, uh, and it, it encouraged me because I'm like, man, that's how the Lord views us. You know, th there's people probably around us that are like, well, that guy, I mean, because we all have our faults and stuff. There's something that, that you guys, every single one of you guys could probably point something out bad about every single person in this room. Probably, if we really thought about it. But the problem, the, the great thing is, is that the Lord doesn't view us that way, if we're his child. He views us as, as he viewed Samson in Hebrews 11, a, a great man of faith, a great woman of faith. And that's encouraging to me because, I don't know about y'all, but I get down on myself sometimes. <laughs> when I mess up, when I slip up. And but one thing that Samson is also known for is he's known as the man with the most potential in the Old Testament. But that potential was never met. A lot of us, maybe if we followed sports or something, we've, we've known people like that. Um, you know, th there's countless stories of, of guys who just get drafted into any sport team and then... Um, you know, they, they get thrown in jail or um, there was even a guy in the early 90s, a basketball player who, who died a few months on a drug overdose after he got drafted. And he was supposed to be one of the best players to ever play. And, and there's been documentaries on him like, would he have been better than Michael Jordan? All this stuff, this potential that was never met. And with Samson, that's, that's a lot like his story. There's a lot of potential, but it was never met. And in chapter 13, the angel of the Lord speaks to Samson's parents and tells them that Samson will deliver the Israelites from the Philistines. But God never really wanted Samson to do it the way he did it at the end of this chapter, I think we'll find out. You know, the Lord never desired that Samson would, would give up his secret and fall into the hands of Delilah and the Philistines. That wasn't like his, the Lord's desire for Samson's life. But he, we will see that he used it in spite of all of Samson's faults. So verse 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. Now this first verse is actually a very troubling verse and a sad one to read if you remember the very last verse of the last chapter. A couple weeks ago when, when it says in verse 20 and 15, and he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And that verse right there, that verse 20, even though it doesn't go into a lot of great detail, but throughout the rest of the book of Judges, when we read the rest of the book of Judges and we see verses like this, that's a good thing. That means the Lord was using him as a deliverer for Israel, as a judge, as a, a ruler over Israel. He was kind of God's man for the hour in Israel. And so, man, yeah, yeah, Samson, a couple weeks ago, Samson ended on a good note. But we see picking right back up we see Samson goes down to Gaza, he sees a harlot, and he goes into her. But see, we, we've seen that Samson was, even though really it could have ended at chapter 15, Samson's story. He judged Israel for 20 years, and he died, and was buried with his fathers. But see, Samson was not done yet, as we see here in verse 1. But we'll also see that God was not done yet. But going back to Samson, as we've seen before, Samson loves to put himself into areas and places that no child of God, especially a Nazarite consecrated from birth, should be found. He goes to Gaza, not the right territory, not the place where he's supposed to be as the ruler, the judge of Israel, and is going to find a harlot. I mean, you want to talk about behind enemy lines? Right in Philistine territory? But see, Samson never thought, up to this point, we've seen that Samson never thought that way. He's always thought about himself. He's always thought about his own pleasures, his own desires. What's best for Samson at the moment? I mean, right when we first are introduced to Samson as a man... He's coming to his parents saying, go get me that, that woman. I want her as a wife. She looks good. 
That's all I know about her. And then we see him going into the vineyard. Then fighting, killing the lion, then hiding the lion. Going back to the lion, seeing some honey in it, in the carcass, and saying, well, that looks good to eat. Even though I'm a Nazarite, I'm not supposed to be defiled by any dead thing. I'm still going to reach my hand in there, in the middle of a vineyard, (laughs) nonetheless, and eat this honey. And not just that, but I'm going to give it to my parents, because, hey, that was some good honey. We see he's acting on his emotions. When he goes back to, to um, you know, when he goes and has the wedding feast and he um, fi- you know, finally gives the, the riddle away to his wife and his wife tells the Philistine men and they tell him the answer and he gets all mad. And so he goes and kills 30 Philistines and gives them their change of clothes. And then he huffs and puffs and gets out of the party. Finally, when he comes back to go get his wife, the father of the bride says, hey, I handed her over to your best man. And what does he do? He goes and he causes more ruckus. Gets a bunch of foxes, sets their tails on fire, and puts it throughout the whole, all the Philistines' uh, vineyards and wheat harvest and everything. He was not a man of patience. He was a man that was defined by how he felt in the moment, what pleased his own desires. But see, as... Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 26 when he's at the Garden of Gethsemane about to go to the cross. He goes and prays by himself. He comes back and they were supposed to be kind of praying with him, watching. And he finds them asleep. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Samson, why is he in Gaza in the first place? Why why are you down that road? Why are you contacting that person on Facebook in the first place? Why are you on that website in the first place? Why is that thing... I mean, the list could go on. Why do you take that road to work instead of that road? We need to be watching. We need to be praying. I mean, that's why Paul tells the Thessalonians church, pray without ceasing. Because temptation is everywhere. And that was back before cell phones and the internet. I mean, I remember, I, I listened, you know, I listened in uh, Bible college to a lot of Chuck tracks. That's Chuck Smith's, uh, he, would, he taught throughout the whole, through the whole Bible. He taught actually through it like three or four times, probably more than that. But it was recorded. And, and uh, this was in the like 70s and 80s. And, uh, you know, he would talk about temptation and be like, and those billboards. And I'm like, I'm thinking, if Chuck only knew then what we have in our hands nowadays <laughs> as temptation. But Sam, I mean, again, what is he doing down there? And there's a, there's a harlot there. And so he's probably not in the best part of town. <laughs> he's not in the historic district. <laughs> It wasn't sightseeing. But see, we'll see that these pleasures, these desires that Samson is so keen to fulfilling are actually going to become his chains. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus is explaining the parable of the sower and the seeds to his disciples when he's talking about the seeds falling in different places. And his disciples are like, what does this mean? In Luke 8, he says that the seeds that fell among the wayside, among the thorns, the ones that spring up and get choked out, that those are the ones that give in to the pleasures of the world and never achieve full maturity. They never are bare fruit. They're never fruitful. They had a good foundation. They started out good, but they let the things of this world choke them out. And that's, and that's what's happening around us all the time. That's what's tempting us all the time, the things of this world. And it's not just sex, drugs, and rock and roll because we know that's bad, right? It's career. It's family. It's me time. 
That's the stuff that's distracting us. That's the stuff that's tempting us. But then those things become our chains. And we can never, when we're choked by those things, we'll never achieve maturity as believers. Verse 2. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is daytime, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he rose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gateposts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. So a pretty crazy thing that takes place here. But one thing that we need to notice is that his sin is, is found out by the Philistines. Samson's in Gaza. He sees a harlot, goes into her, and then Phil, hey, Samson's here. Now again, Samson wasn't this huge, giant Goliath kind of dude that like you could see him from a mile come bodybuilder like, oh, that's definitely Samson, the guy that... I mean, Samson probably looked like me. <laughs> when you think strong, you don't think me. <laughs> Bodybuilders aren't trying to get to my stage. <laughs> trying to get out of it. So Samson probably at uh, first kind of blended in, maybe. His long hair, I don't know. But the Philistines nonetheless find out he's there. And of course, <laughs> he's, he's done so much to them that they're like, he's number one enemy. He's top ten, you know, Philistines top ten most wanted list. He's on the top. And so we see him hiding. This great man of God that before slew so many Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. And yet, now we see him in his sin, hiding. And, and, and that happens to us all the time. When you sin. If you know it's wrong, especially, if you're a believer, when you sin, you don't come out, chest out, with a jawbone of a donkey ready to smite some Philistines who were nothing compared to Samson. But instead you're hiding, you're embarrassed. It's a lot like Peter when he denies Jesus. And he has a little slave girl. Little slave girl. He, Peter had nothing to prove to this little slave girl. But in his sin, he was scared of anything and everything because he knew it was the wrong thing. And she asked him, hey, aren't you that... Weren't you with that Galilean? And he starts cussing and cursing and doing all this stuff. I was not. That's not me. It's this little girl. But we see that God still has favor on him. God allowed him to have this great strength to, to wait at midnight, go to the gate of the city. I mean, obviously he wasn't going to say open up the gate, right? Because <laughs> they're looking for him but pulls up the gate, bars and all, as it says, runs up the hill to Hebron and just places it on there and says, now let's see if you guys are protected. I mean, a gate of a city was everything. It was this protection. It, it, you know, who could go in, who could go out? You have an open gate. I mean, anything and any, anyone could come in. Samson was making a point. And obviously this wouldn't make the Philistines very happy. This wasn't just like, oh man, he got away. This would have infuriated them. So verse 4. Afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the Lord of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now that's a lot of money. But again, 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 Samson is in a place where he should not be. The Valley of Sorek, even though that was supposed to be Israelite territory, was at this time ruled by the Philistines. 
So this lady's in Philistine territory. Again, Samson, what is it? If you're the judge of Israel, what are you doing in the land of the Philistines? He's really got a thing for their women. Missionary dating, as he probably called it. But we see him in a place where he should not be. And we see that he's in love with a woman of very low morals. Because the first thing we learn about her is that she's going to entice her Samson for a bunch of money. I mean, you could essentially say she herself was a harlot for that. I mean, you, you look at all the women. You look at Samson's mom back in, in, in Judges 13 and the faith that she had. All she went through being barren and then finding out that, that her son is now going to deliver Israel. And then now you see all these women that Samson goes after. The first one, he, she looks good, so give her to me. The second one, a harlot. Now the third one, Delilah, who we know is his ultimate downfall. But just a poor choice in woman because he was not watching and praying. He was worried about his own pleasures and desires and what looked good. Now I'll be honest, I was, I was blessed with Brittany. I mean, I, that shouldn't be like, I should be honest about that. I think you all know that. <laughs> It wasn't a secret or anything. But I was really blessed with Brittany. But you know what's funny, and, and, and she'll, she'll tell you this too. When me and Brittany first started uh, hanging out, we, uh, you know, I think this is true of a lot of single people. When you're single and you're at that age where you're kind of looking for your soulmate, your helpmate, any, any one of the opposite sex that comes around, you know, you kind of like, you kind of test them out. This might be the one. Me and Brittany, right off the bat, were like, nope, that's definitely not the one. We had no desire, no, not, not attracted to one another in, in any shape or form. It wasn't until we were hanging out for a couple months that we, uh, you know, the Lord opened up our eyes. And I was like, whoa, man. And she, she said, all right, he'll do. And so, but Samson, just his eyes, oh, wow, that's it what I see, what I can feel, what I can touch, what I can taste. That's what I like. And so that's going to entrap him. Verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and, and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke, broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. See how the question changes from where does your strength lie to where will you, how are you bound? How can I bind you? How can I entrap you? So he said to her, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Therefore Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, standing in the room, but he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. So she wove it tightly with the batten of the loom. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. So we've seen Samson does not like being in the right place at the right time. He loves being in the wrong places. But we also see that Samson loves trotting the line. You know, there's a lot of believers, especially nowadays, that want to know what their, their Christian liberties are. They'll scour the Bible for what they can do. 
I'm a Christian, and I know there's freedom in Christ, so what can I do? I can do this, I can do, oh, wow, ooh, ooh, check that, ooh, you know. Well, what, what's sexual immorality? Let me look at the Greek word. Oh, so that means I can still do this with my girlfriend. I can still do that. I can still watch this. I can still listen to that. Samson loves trotting that line, loves playing that game. Figuring out where that line is. I'm never going to cross it. I mean, Samson probably told, when she first asked him, where's the secret of your strength? He's probably laughing. She'll never find out. I'm just going to mess with her. Yeah, you just got to get fresh bowstrings, which would have been like um, fresh vines, almost. What they would do is they'd twist them together and make ropes out of them. And then the new ropes were essentially the same thing. Um, and then he even, goes, he even gets weird and weaves his hair into a batten of a loom and you know, whips that thing out. And My question in all this, though, when I, when I read this, is uh, when he's playing this game with Delilah three times, every time there are Philistines there to try and capture him, and each time he overpowers them. After the first time when she kind of asked Delilah, why is there a troop of Philistines in your room? <laughs> Second time, you know, the first time, oh, that was a joke. Second time, you're still trying to capture me. Third time, you're still trying to capture me. But see, he likes to be tested. He likes to show that he's always smarter, that he's always faster, that he's always stronger. Samson likes being the top dog in the room, the, the alpha male. This has really been his personality from the beginning. And this all goes back to his, I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll get it. And with that kind of mentality, he's blinded by the harm that Delilah is trying to inflict on him. And to be honest, that, it's kind of odd, especially in our day and age. Usually it's the other way around. Usually you see a lot of Christian women um, who are, who are in, enticed by a, a, a man, a worldly man, and they're like, oh, but he loves me, but he, he provides for me. But everyone else can see he's trying to do you harm. He's trying to lead you down a wrong path. You're blinded by your emotions, by your feelings. And that's just nothing, that's not just to do with love. But our emotions, our feelings blind us in so many other areas. How we think and act, the things we stand up for, things we represent as I say it as Christians, but not in a Christian sense. You know, sometimes we stand up for things and we're believers and we shouldn't be standing up for those things at all because they go contrary to the gospel. But we feel something or it's nostalgic to us. But see, we can do this so much with sin in our lives. As the old saying goes, play with fire and you're bound to get burned. And the problem was that Samson thought he was fireproof. And so in verse 15, we see that. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times. You have not told me where your great strength lies. And again, I, I pointed out earlier, when she first asked him in verse 6, where, you know, where your great strength lies and what you may be bound to afflict you. The second time she says, I just want to afflict you. I just want to bind you. I just want to entrap you. Again, he's blind to the fact that she's openly saying, I want to bind you and afflict you. Again, not the smartest, not the smartest guy on the block. And it came to pass, verse 16, when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death, that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. 
When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all of his heart. And as a lord of the Philistine, I'd be kind of reluctant because I'm like, hey, three times I've got my butt kicked by this guy saying that you, you've done it. Now you're saying he's going to do it. But nonetheless, so the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Since Samson's a man that, lo- that seems to be ruled by how he feels and what pleases him, I am sure the constant nagging and pestering, as, as it even says here, from Delilah was not pleasing for him to hear. Again, someone who's ruled by their emotions, their feelings, they're going to make rash decisions like that. They're going to let little things like that, someone just bugging them, fine, I'll do it. But this isn't the first time we've seen Samson do that. In chapter 14, when he's he's having the big wedding feast, and he gives the riddle to the Philistines, and he hasn't told his wife yet, and his wife just keeps nagging him, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, Finally, he's like, ah, all right. I'll tell you. And he tells her. He gives in. And I think Samson probably thought, you know, they kept bugging me, they kept bugging me, they kept bugging me. I just wanted to tell them. But see, someone persistently asking us to do something doesn't make it right to do it. And I bring that up because, again, a lot of us have still, and I'm not saying in a bad way, I mean, you know, just because we're a Christian doesn't mean we go hide in the woods somewhere and break contact from every single person we ever knew that wasn't, that's not a believer. <laughs> but a lot of us have friends and family, co-workers obviously, that are not believers that are constantly nagging us to do this or do that or give in or, or compromise. And let me tell you from the story of Samson, It'll never end up good by compromising. It'll never end up good. And then we see that Samson tells her his secret, finally. Finally, he's given given it up. But see, he leaves out one very important piece of information, one very important fact when he tells her where his strength comes from. See, he says, No racer has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. Here's where, here's where it is. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. He left out the whole point that it was God who supplied him with strength. See, his hair was merely an outward symbol of his consecra- consecration to God. Because there's other people who had their hair growing out and they weren't as strong as Samson. <laughs> It wasn't a hair thing. It was a God thing. And Samson missed that whole point. Samson thought, if I cut my hair, then I won't be strong anymore. Thinking that all of his strength was in his hair. But see, we as believers have many outward signs that show what God is doing inside of us. And through us, as called our fruit. Maybe you got, you know, many of us have heard that, your fruit as a believer. And, many of, and a lot of times we can get discouraged or, or wrongly assume that because these outward things are a certain way, that God is a certain way. Because we're not doing this, that means God's done with us. We're not doing, or we are doing X, Y, Z, that God's done with us. See, it's, it was not that Samson got a haircut that led him to be weak, but it was unwillingness to recognize where his strength came from, or more precisely, who it came from. See, Samson was a prideful man. We, when, you, when you look at the whole story of Samson, it was his pride. It wasn't his haircut that led him down the wrong path that led him to where he was that led him to have his strength leave him 
In Proverbs 11.2, Solomon says, When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. And again, Samson could not see it. Sam could, Samson could not hear Delilah saying, I want to bind and afflict you. Because he thought he was better than that. He thought that was impossible. He thought there's no way that can happen. It's impossible. He'll never do it. And then we see, we see how he just doesn't care. Look at how comfortable he is after he tells her the secret. He's lying in her lap. She's lulling him to sleep, you know, by rubbing his head, singing him a lullaby. Knowing she's already tried to do him harm. And the last three times he fell asleep <laughs> at her house, he woke up to a gang of Philistines trying to kill him, trying to take him. But as Jesus said again, we must watch and pray. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then it says that when, when he falls asleep, we know, she, you know she gets a guy to come over, cut his hair. And then it says in verse 19 that she tormented him. It actually means, in the Hebrew, that means that she actually was causing him physical harm. I mean, it doesn't go into detail. But she was, she was ruthless. She was evil. Diabolical. I mean, just trying to humiliate and shame Samson. And then we see verse 20. It's one of the saddest verses, I think, in the Bible, that Samson did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He had no idea. And I think one of the main reasons is because he, he never fully understood that it was the Lord that was with him the whole time. He never gave God the glory. He never said, yeah, it was God was the one who gave me this. And so when God left him, to him, it because he was still there. He was still there. So he thought, I'm good. I'm the guy who's been doing all this. I'm all set. And then we see in verse 21, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. Now verse 21, we see how humiliated he was by them. He had caused so much death and destruction. Most of it was really caused by his own pleasures and desires. We see that uh, most of the time it really wasn't even righteous anger. It was just he wasn't getting his way and so someone else had to pay for it. Like a toddler throwing a temper tantrum. But now all these things have come back to him and he's blinded by them and in bondage. And we really see a stark contrast to who Samson thought he was. Before it was whatever Samson saw and looked good, he got, he took. But now he's blinded and he can't see anything. The thing that caused him so much pleasure and happiness by what he could see has been taken away from him. And before, Samson showed everyone that he was a man that could not be tamed or bound. We saw that even this chapter when he put the gates on his back and ran up the hill. Oh, you guys have me in a fortified city surrounded? Well, guess what? I found, you know, the door that you thought was closed and locked. I've gotten through it. No one can bind me. No one can do this to me. And now he's in. Now he's bound with bronze fetters. We see he's just humiliated. Brought back to Gaza where the harlot was. But we see verse 22. However sad verse 21 is, and verse 20 is, we see in verse 22 that God still has grace in him, and that God is still working. As Verse 20 is probably one of the saddest verses in this story, let alone maybe the Bible. I think verse 22 is probably one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible. Because we know that his hair was a symbol of God working in him, 
God working through him, God giving him strength. And so, however the hair on his head began to grow again, just shows that God is still working in him. God is still desiring to use him. God is still wanting to strengthen him. And by this we can see that God is all about reconciliation. Bringing us back to where we once were with him. For us it's the Garden of Eden when we walked in fellowship with God. That is why he sent his son Jesus to die for our sins and pay for our sins. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God here did not impute Samson's trespasses on him. He should have. But again, his hair growing back did not mean that he was strong again, but it was that outward expression of God working in him. And I think Samson starts to take notice. Verse 23. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. When the people saw him, they praised their, their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad who led him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars which support the temple, so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof, watching while Samson performed. We see here the Philistines are so overjoyed that they have captured their great enemy Samson. Now they want to make sport of him. They want to make fun of him. As they say, come bring Samson so he can perform for us. And this is common practice in those days. They would parade around their enemy to show the great victory. And this would have been, again, very humiliating for Samson because even though he could not see them, he could still hear them. I mean, this was, as they even sang, he multiplied their dead. This same city was the city that he took the gates on his shoulders and ran up the hill. And now they're all making fun of him. But it's in verse 26, I think, we start to see the change in Samson's heart. We see in verse 26 that he asks a little boy to help him so he can stand up comfortably. So he can station himself between the pillars. Again, this is Samson. We saw at the beginning he asked his parents for the girl. But I don't even think even if they said no, he would have listened. But this, he doesn't ask anyone for anything. He just takes. He sees, he likes, he takes. Now he's asking a little boy for help just to stand up. Again, I... I I think we're starting to see the change in his heart. Verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of his father Manoah. He had judged Israel 20 years. It's a great ending, but unfortunately this is actually only the second time that we have recorded that Samson talks, cries, calls to the Lord. The first time, really, I wouldn't even call it calling to the Lord. He was complaining to the Lord. He just had a great victory over the Philistines, and then he's crying to the Lord, saying, are you going to let me die of thirst after letting me defeat my enemies, the Philistines? 
And yes, he brought up a good point. But again, he was kind of complaining to the Lord. But this time we see that he calls to the Lord. He cries out humbly to the Lord. He knows that he does not deserve anything. Look what he says. Oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. What, he, what he's saying is, Lord, I don't know if you remember who I am. I don't deserve any of this. It's a lot like the prodigal son returning to his father. I mean, the prodigal son had like this, this speech probably laid out of like, all right, I, I just want to be a servant. If I could just be a servant in your household, I'll do whatever just to be a servant in your household. And what does the father do? He brings him back his son and he makes him a big feast. Again, the ministry of reconciliation that God has for us. But Samson realized he doesn't deserve anything but death for all that he has done. But he also knows there's only one who can give us help in time of need. Strength when we are weak and grace when we fall. And that's the Lord. O oh Lord, strengthen, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. I mean, that's honestly one of the most honest and one of the greatest prayers in the Bible by Samson, of all people. None of us have been told by our, by our friends or kids or pastors, pray like Samson. But this is an honest and great prayer. Oh Lord, remember me and, and strengthen me. I mean, in the Psalms, David says that so many times. Remember me, Lord, I pray. Oh Lord, remember me. And then we see that Samson never heard a voice thunder down from heaven and say, Yes, Samson, I will do it just this once for you, as long as you... No, he doesn't hear God respond at all. We have, no, we have nothing recorded that God responded whatsoever. What we do have recorded, recorded, though, is that he cries out to the Lord, he calls out to the Lord humbly, and then he pushes the pillars. He asks God to do something, and then as, instead of sitting there waiting, like, all right, Lord, you know, just do your thing, just like magic tornado come through and destroy everyone, Samson takes faith and starts pressing against the pillars. Now, the lords of the Philistines are probably looking at him saying, what is he doing? First he's crying out to his God, which I'm sure they were mocking him for. And now he's pushing against the pillars. Blind. Probably beaten up. So weak. And they're like, he can't do nothing. He can't do anything. And so in Hebrews, when it speaks in chapter 11, as Samson, as a man of faith, this is what I believe the writer is referring to. Throughout the rest of Samson's life, I really don't see any faith. I see some good things the Lord does through him, but I, this is the first time that we see Samson's faith. Where he's calling out to God to strengthen him. Instead of just saying, I'm going to do it. But see, Samson knew that this would be his last hurrah. He knew that if he did this, it also meant that he would die. But he was okay with that in his prayer. He's like, I pray just this once. Just let me, let me take vengeance. And he knew these pillars were supporting everything. So if that's coming down, it's coming down on him too. He was okay with suffering death if it meant that the Lord's enemies were destroyed. If it meant showing the Philistines and the rest of the world that the Lord is strong, not Samson. And we see that he did more in his death than his life. And I think that's a great picture of Christ. As we saw in, in chapter 13, how he's a, a great picture of Christ. We see now, again, at the very end of his life, a great picture of Christ. Because even though, as we saw last week in the book of John, Jesus knew that his earthly ministry was not successful while he was alive here on this earth, but once he died and rose again, that's when he was successful. And that's why me and you are here today because of that death and resurrection. So in closing tonight, Spurgeon, so, because what I have to say isn't going to be better than him. <laughs> Spurgeon says that Samson was a man consecrated to the Lord from birth. And he says that so are we, every believer here in this room. Because a lot of times we can look at the story and say, well, that's a pastor 
That's a missionary. That's a worship leader. That's not me. I'm not a cons- I'm not a Nazarite. I'm not a consecrated man. You know, I don't have to worry about all those things. But we are consecrated to Christ to do his will. And we really all have something to learn from Samson. And so I'll quote, quote Hebrews to end us out tonight. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, the writer says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I don't think that could be any more truer for us here today on August 2017 in Savannah, Georgia. That as believers, that's, that's for us right now. That we are consecrated to Him. And that we, we can trip and fall just like Samson. And we need to watch out. Just like Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. We do need to watch. There's the warning. But you know what? There's the encouragement. That God was constantly working. That even when Samson was humiliated and shamed, his hair grew back. That as he crawl, cries out to God, and he has the faith to push the pillars, the pillars come crumbling down. And more so than that, that when God thinks, when God thinks of Samson, you know, if we were to ask God about Samson right now, oh, Samson, my son, the great man of faith that took down all those Philistines in my name, who had the faith to call, the humility to call out to me, the faith to do my work. Ah, Samson, what a guy. And he's saying that about me and you, if you're a child tonight. And I take comfort in that because I, like Samson, have slipped and fell too many times. And I, like Samson, will continue to, unfortunately, because I'm still in this body of sin. But I can take courage knowing that I, have the, I can have the strength of God if I just call out to Him. Lord, remember me. Strengthen me. It's so simple. So, Lord, tonight we, we do call out to You, Lord, to strengthen us. Because especially right now, Lord, this, this life can be so hard, be so tough. The temptations are just pouring in. The things of this world are trying to choke us out. The pleasures of this world are trying to distract us, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray right now that you would give us the strength to press on, to do your work, to do your will, Lord. And that we would remember, like you remember Samson, you remember us. As your children, you love us. But Lord, I pray that we would still learn from the life of Samson. To not think that we're better than anything. But to know that we are susceptible to all types of sin and evil left on our own. But Lord, I pray for a, right now we would be filled with your spirit. Because that's the only way we can, we can counteract any kind of temptation. is only by your spirit. And our flesh... Lord, as you said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We will always lose if we do it in our flesh. So, Lord, I pray that we would stay constant in your word, be filled with your spirit, and just seek you with all our hearts. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, why don't we stand for one last song, and if you have any prayer requests or questions, you guys can come see me afterwards. You guys have a great week. Oh
Father, you are the one that sees the end from the beginning. Lord, you not only see us as greedy and, and selfish and flawed men and women, Lord, but you also see us as glorified. And Lord, we can't wait to, to shed these earthly tents to move on to our new house. But Lord, you want us to wait. And uh, while we do that, Lord, I pray that you would continue to strengthen us. Lord, that you would continue to uh, teach us, to grow us. Lord, that you would um, continue to help us to keep looking up. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll see you guys next time. <laughs>